She had all her stuff packed, ready to leave the day all this happened. And I feel everyone should know what happened to her because it was a brutal murder. He uh, chewed, chewed a part of her intestine. April 10th, 2002. Police get a call from a woman who claims to see a naked man on the street covered in blood, mumbling and chewing while looking at the sky, prompting them to rush to the scene. The girl hung up the phone and ran to her friend's Tanisha Isaias apartment. Upon opening the door, she broke down at the sight before her. 21-year-old Tanisha was in a pool of blood, her chest cut wide open, with multiple teeth marks around her face and lungs. The naked man at the scene was unconscious and only growled in response to the police. He was unrecognizable from all the blood and was taken down to the station. To everyone's surprise, he was identified as Antron Singleton, a.k.a. Big Lurch. Despite the potential for a successful music career, that night changed everything for Big Lurch. He woke up in prison two weeks later, facing various charges including murder, torture, and even cannibalism. The last thing he remembers is thinking the world was going to end, and he had to find and kill the devil. However, four months later, a surprising twist would occur. Tanisha's mother filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Singleton, with new evidence contradicting the conviction. This posed the question, what really happened the night of April 10th, 2002? Antron Singleton was born on September 15, 1976, in Dallas, Texas, to Alfonso and Patricia Singleton. Unfortunately, his parents divorced within a year of his birth, but he managed to stay close with both of them as he grew up. From a very young age, Antron used words and poetry to express himself and his feelings. He began writing poetry when he was seven years old and later turned his poetry into lyrics for songs. By the time he was 15 years old, he had already written many songs and would rap them for his friends performing some at open mic night. This was empowering for him and his friends, who also wrote rap lyrics, as it allowed them to talk about the darker, harder parts of their lives. Surprisingly, in 1995, when Antron was 19 years old, he had a son whom he named Antron Singleton Jr. He wasn't really public about his son or his family, as he likes to keep his personal relationships private. Singleton was still living in Texas at this point and was working hard on his music career. However, he felt that his location was limiting his opportunities as he didn't have many connections in the industry and wasn't seeing much success. He believed that he needed to be in California, where the rap music scene was thriving in the 90s and 2000s, particularly in the San Francisco Bay Area, where all the big names in the industry were located. So. He decided to make a big move and relocated to San Francisco to pursue his music career. To coincide with this new chapter in his life and career, he changed his stage name from G Spade to Big Lurch. His friends had been calling him Lurch for a while, as he was very tall, standing nearly six foot seven, and towered over everyone else in every room he was in. The nickname came from the character Lurch in the Adams Family, a big, tall, and creepy butler. He ended up meeting a rapper named Mac Mall, who introduced him to Mike Mosley, who was a well-known producer in the Bay Area. Mosley had worked with big names, the likes of E-40, Mac Dre, Sibo, and even Tupac. Around that time, Big Lurch was sleeping in somebody's garage, and Mike Mosley felt bad for him and wanted to help him out, as he thought Lurch was talented. I just saw the vision immediately. He was living in the garage and it was cold. You know, and I felt bad. I'm like, man, this dude, is, he's too talented. I put him under my wing and just like took him to my studio. So he was just so excited to be like smack dead in the middle of it. In 1996, Big Lurch finally got his break and was featured on E-40's song, Record Haters, and RBL Posse's song, How We Coming, with Mystical. Every day in the life of a G, we be trifling and we enlighten the sea. Them things like in me. After that, Big Lurch decided to form a group called Cosmic Slop Shop with Rick Rock and Dooney Baby. After they had been working together on a bunch of songs, they ended up getting a record deal with MCA Records 
and released their debut album titled The Family in 1998 with the single Sinful being the highlight of the album. However, the album didn't sell. Instead, it got some negative reviews and ended up not being commercially successful. The group split up and they went doing their solo careers. Big Lurch started putting out mixtapes in the streets to generate a buzz and make some money, but the results were slow. In the year 2000, Lurch received heartbreaking news that his grandmother had passed away. While heading back to Texas for his grandmother's funeral, Big Lurch was involved in a gruesome car accident after a drunk driver hit him head on and he ended up with a broken neck. After almost dying and being in a coma, he had a hard time dealing with the pain and he was still hurting even though they gave him morphine. He has severe nerve and spinal damage and the pain was so bad that sometimes it would just knock him to the ground. This compelled the doctors to give him more morphine shots than normal as the man even barely walked. Lurch would develop an addiction to the morphine and a few weeks after being discharged from the hospital, he ran out of his morphine prescription. He couldn't get his hands on more and therefore looked for an alternative to help cope with the pain. PCP. However, he only took small doses then. During that same time, many record labels started reaching out to him to sign him and help him get back on his feet and he ended up signing with Stress-Free Records, which was owned by a famous lawyer named Milton Grimes. Grimes convinced Big Lurch to sign with him, after telling him he was going to hook him up with Roger Troutman Jr., who was a more experienced artist at the time. Me, you know, you're down and out, you broke your neck, we want to nurse you back to help and help you do an album, because we, we know you're hurting, and you know what I mean? Now, I'm not playing all this coming out. I'm hot, but I'm hurt, and I don't know what's going on. I've been in rehab. I done died. I done been in a coma and all this. One of them was an L.A. label, so they like, you know, well, come out here. We're going to bridge you up, man, and you you work with Roger Troutman Jr., Roger Troutman dude. So I'm like, Roger, you know, I'm a real musician, so I want to work with the most talented people I can. So it wasn't a thing to where I was going to do a, a L.A. album like that. It was a thing that I already had a name for myself, and I... They was providing a platform where I could work with the artists that I wanted to work with. After signing with Stress Free Records, Big Lurch flew to L.A. and began working on his album. However, he didn't like the atmosphere in the studio because he was a Blood Gang member and Grimes and his crew were Crips. Due to the deadly history between the two gangs, Grimes' crew were trying to bully him and make him uncomfortable. They started bumping heads and Big Lurch wanted off the label, so he left and went back to Texas. When he got back to Texas, he wanted to keep on releasing songs, but was short on cash. And so, he went back to hustling and selling drugs. It didn't take long before, he ended up catching a drug charge and was sent to jail. After bailing out, Milton Grimes reached out to him and offered to help him with his case because he was a lawyer, and wanted Big Lurch to come back to the studio and record for the label. Lurch had no other options at the time and agreed. Little did he know. This was the beginning of the end of his career. They started working together again, but he faced the same problems in the studio, but this time, even his life was being threatened. He needed to finish that album though, as he had signed a deal with Milton. So he had to find his ties in LA, blood gang members, so as not to appear vulnerable to the Crips crew in the studio. Aside from that, he hadn't completely recovered from the accident and didn't feel safe enough to protect himself but his new friends, the Bloods, went heavy on PCP aka Sherm. For those that don't know, PCP is a hallucinogenic drug that can alter the user's reality, mood, and thought patterns. It can be sniffed, swallowed, injected, or smoked if a cigarette is dipped into or sprayed by liquid PCP, and it can make people feel invincible, engage in violent behavior, or do something to hurt themselves. At the time, the only drug Big Lurch was used to was weed. He didn't even drink alcohol. Cause they was pushing their weight around, trying to like weight to me, you know what I mean? And I'm like, whoa. So all this tension and all this shit, you know what I mean, led to me, you know, running the L.A. streets and with killers and smoking shine with them. <laughs> because now the tension is on and everybody bringing yeah. their G's around. The politics is out on the streets. And I'm getting word that I'm going to be dead within a week and all this weird old shit that I'm caught up in that I hope those like young Chris Brown them don't, they need to slow down, man. California's a
In order to fit in with his gang, he started smoking Sherm. He even ended up moving in with Thomas Moore, who was known to be a gang member, and at the time was also dating the victim of the murder, Tanisha Isaias. They lived in a dope house filled with weapons, guns, and drugs. It provided a safe spot where other gang members would meet up occasionally. Surprisingly, Thomas and Tanisha had two kids that they were raising at the time. On the night of Tanisha's murder, there was a party at the house, but the kids were not around. It was the Hoodie Awards celebration, and according to Antron, PCP got passed around. The method used that night was cigarettes were dipped in the PCP and then smoked. Antron says they kept feeding it to him. So much was given to him that it stood out as strange to him at the time. The next thing he knew, he woke up in jail with a murder charge, two weeks later. The last thing he remembers was the world was ending, and he had to find and kill the devil. One night, well, we went to the Hoodie Awards and all that, and I'm with one of my big G homies. I want to fit in, you know, I don't want to look like a punk, you know. I'm like, I didn't hit it before, but I don't get high. I, don't get high. I wake up, man. I had been in jail for like two weeks. What the hell, you know? My car. He wasn't aware of his surroundings for a full two weeks, and he discovered that he already had a lawyer, Milton Grimes the same man who owned the record label Antron had just joined. His lawyer began to tell him that they needed to make the case look as bad as possible so that he'd be sent to a psychiatric hospital. He also discovered he was on the antipsychotic drug haloperidol. This drug normally is supposed to suppress the PCP, but its side effects include numbness. The victim becomes numb and is unable to speak for themselves as well as reason. According to reports, the story goes, Thomas, who was Tanisha's husband, left earlier during the party to go handle some stuff. While under the influence of PCP, Singleton forced everyone out of the apartment except for Tanisha. He then came up behind her and struck her in the back of the head with a child scooter. While she laid there, he allegedly took a knife from the kitchen and repeatedly stabbed Tanisha in the chest, before ripping her open. He then removed her right lung along with other organs and started eating them. As if this horrific act wasn't enough. He took off his clothes and ran down the street. This was when Tanisha's friend Alyssa saw him and decided to call the police. She described him as naked and covered in blood. He was looking to the sky, chewing and mumbling while also pulling his hair out. The police, who upon arrival, claimed that Big Lurch growled at them like a dog before arresting him. Alyssa, deeply distressed, entered the apartment to find Tanisha in a gruesome state, barely recognizable due to her chest being torn open and she was missing parts of her internal organs. Tanisha had multiple stab wounds, a broken neck and jaw, teeth marks on her face, and a fractured eye socket. She even had a knife blade fragment stuck on her shoulder. Strangely, during examination, a lot of PCP was found in her system, despite her not being known for drug use. The medical examiner speculated that someone must have forcibly poured the PCP down her throat. As for Lurch, Medical examination revealed human flesh in his stomach, which matched the victim's parts that were eaten. When Milton and Lurch discussed the case, Milton advised him to plea insanity for a shorter sentence. But in California, that plea doesn't apply when drugs are involved in the crime. The state doesn't accept the defense that being intoxicated or on drugs led to committing murder. Bear in mind, Milton is a well-reputable lawyer, so how did he miss that simple fact? Instead, he held it up high as his only defense in the Lurch's case, claiming Lurch would go in for a few years and would be out in no time. Additionally, Milton failed to provide him with regular clothes for court hearing, making him appear unsettling in the courtroom, which didn't benefit his case. He also advised him not to testify. November 7, 2003, during the trial, in addition to tangible evidence, the court used Lurch's unreleased album, It's All Bad, particularly a song called I Did It To You, against him claiming he was obsessed with this type of evil long before committing the murder. Big Lurch is one of the pioneers of horrorcore rap. In about 30 minutes, the jury deliberated and found Lurch guilty of first-degree murder, torture, and aggravated mayhem, sentencing him to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Later, following his conviction, Big Lurch now with a clear mind off the haloperidol, began speaking out about how his lawyer allegedly set him up by withholding crucial information and evidence. He even claimed that Milton ignored his calls after the conviction. 
Interestingly, four months later, Tanisha's mother, Carolyn Stinson, filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Big Lurch, his bodyguard, stress-free records, death row records, and Tanisha's boyfriend. The lawsuit claimed that record labels provided drugs to make Big Lurch more marketable as it would give him street credibility. Death Row Records initially included was later dismissed from the lawsuit after Shug Knight denied knowing Big Lurch. A new perspective to the case unfolded. Carolyn claimed that, on the night of the murder, Tanisha had packed her stuff and was ready to leave. She says Lurch was set up and only found the body in the house when everyone else had left. As he was high on PCP, he saw the piece of lung lying there and thought it was food. Apparently fingerprints found on the knife didn't match his, and someone else's handprint with Tanisha's blood was found on the child's scooter, which was used to kill her. But I'll never forget, you know, what happened to her. But yeah, I forgave him. I don't believe he done that. If I believe he probably was off on that PCP and, you know, he tripped. He saw that piece of lung lying on the floor and he, you know, probably figured it was a piece of meat or whatever. So he just took it and started chewing on it. But far as him, no. I don't believe that. You might be thinking, why didn't Lurch say anything during the trial? Big Lurch was actually on the haloperidol meds. He didn't understand any of the trial proceedings. Some witnesses, allegedly, were coerced into lying and taking advantage of Lurch's situation. Big Lurch asserted that his lawyer, Milton Grimes, failed to mention his pit bull in the house, which could have explained why Tanisha's body parts were chewed up. Teeth marks on Tanisha's body didn't match his own. All these weren't mentioned in court thanks to Milton who thought pleading insanity was the best defense. An intriguing aspect emerged as Big Lurch questioned why his clothes were never found in the house, which was a trap house with guns and drugs. Nigga, we were heavily armed up in there, you know what I mean? We had all kind of guns up in there. But when the police hit the spot, there wasn't no guns up in there. There's evidence there like footprints, fingerprints on doors, you know, bloody fingerprints. You know, shoe at the back door. You know, and it's like, where all this evidence go? It was DNA. Who DNA was? They said DNA came up lost. The house was mysteriously cleaned up before the authorities arrived. Feeling set up by his lawyer and friends, he suggested the real killer is free while he serves time for cannibalism, facing threats from both police and gang members in prison. Carolyn Stinson consistently believed Big Lurch was set up, pointing to Tanisha's abusive boyfriend as the real killer. Stinson argued that Big Lurch didn't receive a fair trial, and despite her willingness to testify in his favor, his lawyer Milton never obtained a statement from her. If this trial isn't suspicious enough for you, less than a year later, Milton was ordered to pay $1.2 million to the mother of a man shot after the jury, found that Milton failed to properly litigate the case. Stinson visited Big Lurch, expressing her belief in his innocence and forgiveness for her daughter's murder. Despite a previously denied appeal, Big Lurch continues to fight for another chance, facing challenges in finding legal representation due to his cannibalism charge. Wow, that has to be one of the most intriguing cases in hip-hop history, from the act to conviction and even the aftermath, all being a mystery. But sadly, let this serve as a cautionary tale, as a young woman lost her life in the hands of a brutal murderer. May Tanisha Isaias rest in peace. Was justice served? What are your thoughts on the video? Leave your comments down below. Also remember guys, that in whatever you face in this life, there is always one to whom you can turn to, Jesus. His mercy and grace is forever sufficient. May God bless you.